Welcome, everybody, to this CNBC debate on the 2012 Global Outlook. Thank you very much for tuning in, and thank you, our audience, for being here. Now, we're not very good with change, are we? We fear it. We resist it, and yet we know that change is a daily part of everybody's life. We say, uh, let's make do and mend. Uh, we also say, if it ain't broke, let's not fix it. Some way implying that if we were to start tampering, then maybe we could make things worse. Goodness, we know that there are one or two industries at the moment with very large lobbying budgets whose whole basis on preventing regulation is let's not tamper because you might make things worse at the moment. But in 2012, we also know that just won't do, will it? Rising unemployment, inequality and social unrest tell us that change is coming. Change is going to be a very big part of this year. So how does business and business leaders get ahead of that change? How do they make sure that, that we don't see um, politicians who are seeking votes in 2012 try to impose the wrong kind of change on the business community? How do we make sure that overzealous regulators don't, in a way, take away the golden goose that could potentially lay the golden eggs for our global economy in 2012? Let's introduce you to our panel. Peter Vossa joins us from Royal Dutch Shell. Cheryl Sandberg from Facebook. Alejandro Ramirez from Sinopolis. Paul Polman is here from Unilever. Vikram Pandit has joined us from City, and Yasuchika Hasegawa from Takeda Pharmaceuticals. Vikram, let me um, start with you, perhaps, with a question that's very much of the moment, but in many ways will shape the year as we know it this year. Change needs good leadership. Are we fi finally seeing what we need to see when it comes to the Eurozone debt crisis? <coughs> We've got to start by acknowledging some of the actions taken by the ECB in the last few months are quite significant. Uh, Mario Draghi has understood very well the need for having a stable banking system and he's made some changes there. The Eurozone actually is also moving fast on a fiscal compact uh, which, uh, which can bind together the country. So a lot of positive actions that we've seen. The market sentiment has gotten a lot better. On the other hand, there's still a lot of uncertainty ahead of us. What the markets want to know is what's going to happen to the one and a half trillion euro of sovereign debt that needs to get refinanced between now and three years from now. And by the way, will there be the availability of funds f to make that happen? And so I look at this and I say that we're heading in the right direction. We've got to work just a little bit more to get over the humps. And this is a critical issue. The Eurozone crisis is probably the most significant overhang on global markets. And I say that because it's costing us about 1% in GDP around the world. And you do the math. I mean, you, the, you do the math, say, how many jobs is that? How many people are, are not working because of that? What could we do to go after the biggest question we've got for this decade, between now and the end of the year, which is jobs? The world needs 400 million new jobs between now and year end, uh, decade end, and not counting the 200 million that you need just to get back to full employment right now. That's 600 million jobs. That should be our number one priority. So I, I take that as a cautiously optimistic on what we've seen so far. But let me broaden it out among the panel, because I know your industry is particularly sensitive to a resolution of this crisis. But let me ask um, anybody else on the panel who'd like to chip in on this. How would what seems to be stabilization and resolution early into this year mean for changes in any business decision you are likely to take through the course of this year. Peter, you're a, a European-based CEO. Perhaps you could give us some insights. I think two, <clears throat> two quick points here. The one is purely in the energy industry. We cannot actually just look at the next few quarters because we are a 20, 30 years time horizon business and therefore we need to keep going on, on our strategy and just invest through the cycle. But there is a but to that, which is the second point. Economic uncertainty always means that companies will look at their investment risks through a different lens. 
And I think that's where we need the certainty, that companies actually can start to invest again. And we know that, for example, in the energy industry, over the next 20 years, we need close to $40 trillion of investments. And as soon as we slow that down, we will have less energy coming into the system over the years to come, and demand goes up again. And that will mean higher prices, more volatility in the prices, which then in turn again is not good for the economy. So therefore, strong signs of certainty will lead to investment, and that's what we need in 2012. Paul. Yeah, I think the uh, euro crisis is one thing, and Fikram has well, uh, well explained that, and I think we'll work our way through it, but actually the underlying reasons need to be addressed, which is the uncompetitiveness of the eurozone. And uh, there is an incredible amount of deleveraging that needs to happen over the next few years, which will result in slow growth. Any 1% cut in government spending is a 0.75% reduction in growth. So we will be focused more as a company, because we still have about 25% of our business in Europe, fortunately over 55% in the emerging markets, but we will be focused on getting Europe competitive again, and I think that is important. So fix the short-term issues, but work also with Brussels and others involved in getting the long-term competitiveness of Europe again at a level that uh, gives us equitable and sustainable growth also for Europe in the future. It's very important. How, how does that competitiveness come back? Because we're in the, we're in the great age of deleveraging, obviously, here. Yeah. And people's idea at the moment, or government's ideas at the moment, it seems, of competitiveness all revolve around firing people driving down salary expectations, persuading people that their living standards are going to have to fall as they embrace the new normal, as our friend over at PIMCO described it. Yeah, there is definitely a readjustment that needs to happen in Europe because if you want to really simplify it, we've lived above our means and we've done that for too long and the moment of truth has arrived which means that we need to redistribute. It will not be very good for Europe in the next 10 years if uh, youth unemployment will go up. We have in some places in Europe 45% youth unemployment. Uh, the risk of whole generations not entering the workforce would do lasting damage to, to a, a continent like Europe. So we need to look at redistribution. We need to create more flexibility in the uh, labor market. And as we talk about solving the Eurozone crisis and the need for growth, we are still able to pass legislation in Brussels at 100 miles an hour that actually reduces our relative competitiveness. So the business leaders need to be heavily involved, need to give our politicians courage, and need to be part of that change. Otherwise, this continent will pay a price. As a company itself, increasingly our business will be in the emerging markets because let's not forget, in about 30 years' time, 85% of the population will live outside of the US and Europe. But it would be a sad story for all of us Europeans if we don't work on it now, and that's really what I'm advocating. Look, um, you look around the world, and it's not just limited to Europe. Um, quite frankly, Japan has this issue. America hasn't even started here. Governments are fat, heavy, and slow, and they're going to have to go through a process of reducing and slimming down. Companies, I have to say, by and large, when you look around the world, large companies and medium-sized companies at least, they seem to be quite swollen with cash. The governments are hoping those companies are going to step in and start providing some of the services that governments are going to stop providing, and they also hope that those private companies or publicly listed companies are going to start providing jobs. So I think my question, and I'll throw it out to anybody who wants to pick it up at this point, how do we get you to create demand by creating more jobs. Who wants to start? Cheryl. We can talk about this. So we've been looking at this, and the internet sector as a sector you know, has been creating jobs. McKinsey put out a study in May of this year saying that the internet sector over the last 15 years in 13 countries created 7% of the GDP growth. And we did a similar thing looking at what Facebook's done. Deloitte did a study in Europe and said that in 2011, Facebook and the platform companies and the companies that market created, added 15.3 billion to the GDP, real value added, because that was on 13, 32 billion of revenue, and created 230,000 jobs. And so we believe that the other thing the government has to do is make sure we set industry and different sectors up for success. So education is critical. If we want technology to continue to grow, mm -hmm. we need great scientists and we need them all over the world. Mm. 
investment in infrastructure is critical, yeah. and the right regulatory environment, as you mentioned in your opening, is really critical so that yeah. these sectors can thrive. In the, um, in the old days, of course, companies used to educate their workers. They take them in as raw talent, and then they do a lot of the education themselves. They um, would also perhaps provide them with housing. They provide health care, perhaps low interest rate loans, maybe even tax-free savings products. All of those things seem to be gone, but governments are saying they're not going to provide them anymore. Which one of you is going to be bold enough to step in and start bolstering those parts of your offering? Yeah. Yeah, we are pretty much uh, a regulated industry, a pharmaceutical industry is. But uh, if we, uh, we take a look at Japan, uh, population is now declining, and the market is, uh, economy is very stagnant. So it is very difficult to create a job, even uh, for the pharmaceutical industry, no matter how much uh, profit you make. But what we are trying to do is uh, instead, if uh, we look around the neighborhood countries, including China and the ASEAN countries, they are rapidly growing. So expand our operations uh, to those countries mm. and help them to uh, grow up uh, their economy and also uh, taking the fair share uh, of the uh, growth pie, bring back to Japan and uh, pay the, uh, pay the uh, you know, tax to the we don't say Uncle Sam, but the government, yeah. then government can use uh, that right. money for elderly care or any other uh, internal domestic demand stimulation. That's the uh, uh, way we are thinking right now. Thank you. You wanted to jump in? Oh, well, I think ultimately uh, it is about growth. There's nothing yeah. that creates jobs better than growth. And the questions to ask ourselves is what can create the conditions for that growth to happen? Mm. Well, you heard two things today mm. so far on the uh, panel. One, let's get the immediate uncertainties behind us, the Eurozone mm. crisis. Really important. Second, uh, regulatory uncertainty. Let's try and get those things behind us. But there is something a little bit deeper than that. We've got to recommit to those principles that can drive growth. One. Recommit to globalization because it is about trade. It's trade between emerging markets and the developed markets. By the way, that trade is going up exponentially, particularly between emerging markets and emerging markets. When you look at regulations, we talk global, we think national. The second aspect that we must recommit ourselves to is understanding that it's not about the private sector or the public sector. For too long, the two have been at odds with each other. We've got to work together. It's about public-private partnerships, and there's no place you can see it better than building out infrastructure. Give, give us one concrete example of how we can do that. I said exactly the way you should do it is through uh, projects to build out infrastructure. And by the way, uh, when you look around the needs the world has, that mm. is still the number one need. And if you yeah. don't have infrastructure, you don't have growth. And I guess the last thing I'll say for my own industry is that we've got to have the right balance between safety and soundness and those conditions yeah. to ensure growth. And, and, you know, I think for all of us as businesses, we acknowledge, uh, and particularly in the financial sy uh, system, that we've got to rebuild trust. And yeah. we are doing and that. Which is, a great, which is a great point, because just let me, uh, yeah. let me make this point. Of course we want growth, but the problem is at the moment that people around the world feel that that growth is not being shared equitably. Mm -hmm. They feel that some have it and some don't have it, and some are doing better from it than others. And it, it in part brings us back to the financial system, but only in part. So let me just throw this question out to you. Do we, are we comfortable that we have compensation models in business and in the financial sector that are both transparent and acceptable to everybody? And if we aren't comfortable with that, what do we need to do at this point? And how do we galvanize perhaps compensation committees or shareholders or stakeholders or governments or the general public through social networking perhaps to force that change if there are still, none of you people let me say, but if there are still some old corporate dinosaurs who feel that they have a right and an obligation to being paid a whole lot more than their workers. Let me throw it out. Alejandro. Well, I think it's, it's a, a quite thorny issue at the moment. I think. Uh, uh, you know, the, there's a lot of reports that have uh, revealed that, you know, uh, income inequality is growing in almost uh, every country. And, and of course, there's uh, the, the uh, backlash that, uh, you know, in public opinion about, you know, uh, corporate compensation. But uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in emerging markets, uh, in Latin America in particular, you know, the uh, 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 corporate governance has uh, increased in, in the past uh, couple of years. And I think uh, uh, there, there is... Uh, I mean, we need to um, 
have more transparency and, and we need to um, uh, in some way um, uh, reduce uh, the, the income inequality that we're seeing uh, almost everywhere in the world and, and that is you know creating this backlash of public opinion yeah Paul well there's no doubt that any growth that is not more equitable than it is today where only a few people benefit and many others uh, don't participate in that process will not be a lasting system and I see you see some cracks happening right now I don't I don't think anybody disagrees with that and it is in our interest in across the total world to be sure that many people are lifted out of poverty it's unacceptable that in today's world a billion people go to bed hungry uh, every day whilst not a billion are obese um, and it's unacceptable that 200 million people cannot enter the workforce and get their respect and dignity that we all deserve so we agree with that as, co as far as compensation is concerned um, it's what Alejandro was saying transparency is the first thing and there's a lot of legislation in that direction I would add to that linking it to performance there needs to be a clear link to performance and then it gets to my third point that needs to be long-term performance uh, the um, if reward is linked to long-term performance and to some extent the market forces will give us differences within a reasonable limit I would be the one advocating for that as well I think we'll live in a better system but more importantly is how do we pull up the people that are excluded from the workforce mm. the bottom of the pyramid mm. to participate in this enormous wealth creation that globalization has brought and that we haven't quite figured out yet Vikram well I think uh, Paul's got exactly the right points uh, let me tell you as one company what are we doing we're committed to three very important principles it has to be pay for long-term performance that's how you structure compensation Two, it's got to be a meritocracy you have to pay people for how they do and the third is we have to be cognizant of the fact that we do live in a market economy and that we've got to deal with that those are three important principles but the most important thing Paul said which I would say is you got to create those conditions to make sure there's growth everywhere else and for financial industry that's all about supporting the real economy are we lending to individuals are you lending to small and middle sized enterprises are yeah. you making sure people are in their homes that's what we can do so the president in his state of the union said we need to start taxing the millionaires in america and he threw out a few numbers but let me ask you about the broad point mm -hmm. is president obama saying the right thing at the moment and is this an approach that we can all agree is the right so one? let me start by saying I think one of the most important thing in the US is tax reform you got to have tax reform it's got to be comprehensive and one of the reasons why you need tax reform is that's how you're going to deal with the deficit we've been talking about Europe there is the US out there and we've got to make sure those two come together in the context of that I believe everybody should be willing to do their fair share. We've got to take a quick break. We'll be back in just a moment. When we come back, why isn't green technology thriving at $100 a barrel oil? We'll see you after this. <laughs> Hello. Um, which way? Where do you want me? Okay. How's that? We're talking about the great issues for 2012 and one of the biggest, I guess, is energy and what happens with the energy complex in 2012. Uh, Peter, let me, let me start with you. You're the natural person to ask on this. Oil, uh, oil price volatility has been phenomenal over the last 18 months, I guess, and we've had the, the Arab Spring and we've had what's going on in Iran and that has contributed to that and we've also had a lot of movement in supply and demand flows in developed and developing world um, economies at this point. So is, let me ask you firstly, is that volatility here to stay throughout 2012? 
And secondly, what does that mean for the way we should all think of investing in the economy today? I think the volatility will stay. It is not just 2012. It will actually stay for the longer term. I think you use the term new normal. I think the new normal has prolonged periods of price volatility and cyclicality. I think this is not going to go away and we need, need to, we will have to get used to it. The second point is energy will be more costly in general. The, it will actually go up. We also, this, the third point is, we will need investments in all energy forms. So starting with renewables, starting with fossil, nuclear and any R&D which we are investing to. Because we will have a, a doubling of the, uh, the demand of energy over the next um, 40 years as world population goes up to 9 billion, we still have 1.5 billion, uh, billion people without access to electricity and energy. And all of them go through the most intensive energy phase in their life at the moment. Therefore, again I come back to my earlier point, investments need to happen in renewables, green technology you mentioned, they need to go on. We need to find ways actually to develop all of them. But also, I'm a market-driven person. We cannot go on forever subsidizing. We need breakthroughs on innovation. We need breakthroughs on, on technology. So therefore, R&D spend, um, investments into education, into scientific education mm. is absolutely key. But, and let me not ask an oil man, this question now, but let's ask someone who's in a different sector of the economy. Cheryl, maybe we could just ask you, um, how do you justify to your board, or maybe ultimately shareholders at some point when it comes to your, your business, but how do you justify to those people that you are going to invest in a technology today that is a lot more expensive than perhaps going with carbon which we know is going to be around for the next 30 years at least. And if you look at the LNG price, wow, that's destroying the economic model, isn't it, for green technology? So the way we think about this is that, you know, as Facebook, as social media, we have an obligation to contribute back. And we contribute back in lots of ways and try to do it in every sector. And we've done this in two ways. For us, we run on data centers. They use a lot of energy. And historically, in our industry, people have figured out more efficient ways to run data centers and held that knowledge for themselves. And it becomes a competitive advantage. We did the opposite. We worked on a new uh, platform to running a data center more efficiently. And then we open sourced it. So we found a way to run our data centers were 38% more energy efficient than the average. And we open sourced the whole thing and just put it out to the world. It's a project we called Open Compute to say, here, we got 38% more. Can other people contribute? Can we all start working together? Energy efficiency can't be a competitive advantage. Energy efficiency has to be something that we all try to give back. And the second thing we've done is we've partnered with Opower and others to take this to consumers. People are in the process right now of building apps that will measure how much energy an individual is using and importantly share that with their friends. And the idea behind that is if people start sharing and actually competing, I can cut this much energy, what can you do? And then sharing with their friends how. It's not just the oil sector or the government that has responsibility, but companies and other sectors and individuals. Do you think that that model can be applied to uh, older, more <laughs> traditional industries who see the cost of energy as part of their competitive advantage? You know, I think industry responsibility and individual action in this world can be applied to anything. I think we are seeing what happens when individual citizens and individual people all over the world get voice in a new way. Historically, in order to broadcast, in order to have a big opinion, you know, you had to be an anchor on CNBC or own a newspaper. You had to be one of the historically powerful. And as social media is rolling out, we're shifting. And the historically powerless are getting voice. And I think that voice can and will be applied across every sector all over the world. You're going to give me delusions of grandeur if, uh, if you pursue that line for too long. Let, 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 let me pass it along uh, here. Paul, I, I call it's yours a more mature industry. It's not only about the price of energy. It's not only about the price of energy. It's about the responsibility we have to be very careful with our scarce resources. 
that is equally important. And there's a pricing mechanism that drives behavior, but there's also a social consciousness, I hope, still in this world mm. that drives behavior. We in our own uh, operations have about 3 million tons of CO2 emission, but that's our factories, our travel. Sure, we cut those down, but our total value chain is over 400 million. So why don't we work with the industry together, like we did this week at the World Economic Forum, to move to natural refrigerants for our ice cream cabinets and our freezers and coolers. That's 4% of the global warming. Why don't we look with um, uh, the industry to bring energy to a broader path of the population in a, a, a responsible way, green energy? And that's what we are talking here in the World Economic Forum. Um, models like Ben & Jerry's, one of our ice creams, is totally carbon neutral. And that's why consumers buy it. And they're willing to pay the price for it because they, they feel not only that they get a good ice cream, but that they make a contribution to a better world. So I think irrespective of the price of ice cream, there are enough arguments to invest mm. to get us to use less resources mm. that make sense for your shareholders, if that's what you're after. Yeah. But more importantly, it makes sense for the consumers who care about this planet. But does the climate change agenda um, actually work now um, in an age where we have austerity. You know, we, we, we've all been coming to Davos and the World Economic Forum for many years, and you sit there and the numbers got more and more exaggerated. Oh, we need a trillion dollars to make climate change happen. Oh, we need ten, 10 trillion dollars. And if we only got governments to focus on that and business to spend, we could have a real climate change agenda. Now we know governments are not going to spend that kind of money, and it's going to be tough to ask private companies to do that in this environment. Um, what do you think? Uh, do, we, do we now have a climate change agenda that isn't worth the paper it's written on? I think even in a context of austerity, there are things that can be done, there are policies that can be applied that, and interventions that have a, a net present value, a positive net present value. And I'll give you uh, two examples from, from my country, from Mexico. Uh, uh, about 40% uh, of the households in Mexico had very old appliances, specifically refrigerators. And the government realized that those refrigerators were very uh, energy inefficient. And they, they were you know, consuming much more energy uh, than they needed to. So they, they had a, this uh, government program that switched all refrigerators for new ones. So there was a, an incentive because they were subsidized. And uh, with that, you know, Mexico is saving uh, 5% in, in electricity. And the same thing was done with light bulbs. You know, the, uh, all throughout uh, Mexico, there, there was a government program to switch uh, you know, non-efficient light bulbs for energy efficient light bulbs. I think, I think you're saying a very important thing here about changes that are happening all across the global economy as we know it, that the multilateral big picture approach has failed and that you're going to smaller initiatives that are, that are happening because governments and local communities want them to happen. They think it's the right thing to do and the multilateral large big picture story of COP15 type agendas seems to be fading into the background here. Peter, I know you want to talk about this. Yeah, maybe four points. If you look at the investments in 2011 on renewables or green energies, it had, an, again, a phenomenal growth. So I, I understand that it has slowed down in some areas, but it is actually still growing very fast, which is your point as well. The second one is um, we, we at, at Shell for now more than a decade, we actually assume a CO2 price in any investments which we do. And I think that's something we could all commit. And when we look at our investments, then let's assume, and we use $40 a ton, and you can argue if it is right or not, but we use it. And an investment needs to actually meet that hurdle as well. We could all commit to that when we look at internal and external projects to actually, actually do that. The third one for me is we need a CO2 price in general because that will actually also drive the right investments. It will drive the, the right innovation, the right technology. So if we can't land that on a global basis, which I understand is quite difficult, yeah. we have now a few countries which are driving it, and you see actually a different behavior. So I don't understand why we are not that actually can drive that on a global basis in a different way, and it would make a big difference. Vikram, I've got one very quick question for you. Um, gas could raise the possibility that the United States has energy independence and security for the first time in decades. But is that a good thing for the rest of the world that's seen a US having to engage internationally because it's needed energy security? 
So I think your point on natural gas is exactly right. It's not only in the U.S. There are huge fines in the Mediterranean Sea. There are fines all over the world. It's incredible how much gas, natural gas, we found over the last five years around the world, and these will be transformative. Not only in the U.S., they'll be transform transformative everywhere else. I'll tell you, the wonderful thing about uh, gas is that's clean energy. It's clean energy, and of course, for us as a bank, our job is to finance transformative projects, and we're doing that. We're doing that in financing projects in the Mediterranean. We're doing that uh, in the U.S. Just as, by the way, this is our 200th year. You know, we finance Panama Canal, transatlantic cable, satellites, mm -hmm. jumbo jet. Mm -hmm. So it's something we know how to do mm -hmm. very well. I do think uh, the one of the biggest drivers of cost structures around the world, and get to getting to competitiveness, is to get to cheaper sources of energy, cleaner sources of energy, and it actually could be a wonderful supply-side stimulus to get all this gas monetized into real energy. So that's a no, is that <laughs> we shouldn't be fearful of a U.S. that is energy secure? Well, I think having energy security should be an objective for everybody. Yeah. And if the U.S. is energy sufficient, energy secure, yeah. that's a good thing. Good. Vikram, thank you very much indeed for that. Well, we're going to wrap up this bit of the conversation about energy. We're going to move on. Is the internet and social networking safe from governments? Or perhaps it should be our government safe from the internet and social networking. <laughs> we'll be back after the break. <laughs> Yes, yeah, surely. Good. Uh, how's it going? It's all right. Good. Good. Thank you. Are you okay? Mm. We look messy. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I know, but. Okay. Yeah, I know, but. <sighs> Thank you. Okay. Yeah, yeah, hi, Leonie. Will you okay for next time? Yeah. Yeah. We can have a go. Yeah. 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 Where would you like me? On the step. Okay. We're going to come back in the same place. Uh, okay. Okay. Are we? Yep. Yep. We're back, everybody. You're watching this special CNBC program on the global outlook for 2012. Let's talk about freedom for the internet and social networking. The question I asked as we were going into the break is, is the internet and social networking safe from government interference? Cheryl. So we think, and I think a lot of people think, that the internet and mobile technology really represents one of the best opportunities we've ever had to advance the human condition. And there's been a lot of concern that not everyone had access. And historically, we talk about the digital divide as the divide between people who are connected and who aren't. And that divide is still very important. But increasingly, with mobile access growing, fewer and fewer people have no access at all. There's a new digital divide, I think, that's coming out, which we spoke about. And I think you really thought of it this way, mm. which is you know, the difference between people who have access to a free and open internet and people who have access, but they have access to an internet that's increasingly narrow and closed. Mm. And, you know, we think, of course, this is hugely important because you can see the impact both on individuals and on governments of real access to information. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us, not just those of us in my sector, but across the world, to really make sure that we are strongly for an Internet where people have expression, an Internet where people are also safe and secure and their privacy is protected, mm. and an Internet where people can communicate and share as they want to. Super important for the world. So everybody in the room is thinking, yeah, you know, those Chinese or those uh, Arab countries in the Middle East who are trying to lock down social networking. They don't want a free internet. They don't want their people to be well informed. They don't want them to engage through social media. But, but let's yeah. ask our CEOs. So I know of a number of media companies, and mine is not limited, that issues um, regulations, rules on how we use Twitter. It tells us which social networking sites we should be able to use in office time 
and there's a suggestion that maybe we don't want to use them in our leisure time either, lest what happens in our leisure time come back and affect what happens in our work time. So I'd like to run along each of you and ask you, what is your policy on Twittering and on Facebook and on other social networking sites? Peter. We as a company are facing our consumers and our customers and they are using it. And hence I'm, and therefore Shell has a rather open approach to this and therefore it can be used. And it should be used in the right way for the company but also for our consumers. And by the way, I get now a regular update what's going on in the social networks as a CEO. That's summarized so that I actually feel, I can feel where is our brand going, where, what our customers are thinking, what our suppliers are thinking. So I think I have embraced it in a different way. I've said this is part of our life, of society, and hence we are going to use it in the way that we actually can improve our uh, sustainable performance for the longer term. For us, uh, social media is a very powerful tool to interact with our customers. In, uh, we have a, on our Facebook uh, page in Mexico over 2 million fans. We actually were the, the first company to start selling tickets for movie theaters through the through Facebook platform. And, uh, and, and for me, you know, Twitter is also a very powerful tool to communicate with customers directly. They know my Twitter account, so it's, it's a, a direct uh, way to contact the CEO of the company. And, and I ask all of my senior executives to have a Twitter account and to actually tweet and, and to respond you know, to, to customers that contact us through social media. Yeah, well, dealing with millions of consumers a day, um, totally open We have our own Facebook, obviously working very uh, actively with the uh, co new companies in that space. Uh, the only thing we don't do is uh, pay for overtime if someone Twitters or uses Facebook in the weekends. <laughs> we apologize for that. But um, we certainly make the technology available, and I think you have to. The, um, here again, it's a question of, um, you know, new technology, you don't stop. I, th I don't think it, it would be foolish for governments to stop that. I think uh, uh, I just came back from uh, the Middle East and the use of uh, the uh, social sites is probably one of the highest in the world there. And it really is a positive force for society if you channel it in that direction and that's what we should focus on. The same in companies. Um, you shouldn't focus on the rules or regulations on how to use it. You should actually strengthen the values that you have as a company. And these values will guide you in proper usage. We obviously have some values that if, if um, social media would be used for purposes that would not fit with our values, there are strong consequences. So I think it's far more important to let technology go and to spend a lot of time on who you are as a company and trust your employees to simply do the right thing. So as a regulated company, and banks are certainly regulated uh, well around the world, by and large the decision of how we use media is made for us. And, you know, but that's not the question. I think the question to us has been one about how do we use all the changes in technology to go after the two and a half billion people in the world that are not part of the financial system. So financial inclusion is a big, big goal for us. And what technology does is reduces friction cost dramatically. Social networking is friction, friction cost on ideas, but mobile is about getting to the last mile. So we're, we're just starting something with US aid. Uh, and, and they've been instrumental in driving change and development around the world. Mm -hmm. And the job is to get vouchers health vouchers down to the last mile, the last person, transportation vouchers down there, get food coupons down there. When we, when we had the accident in Haiti, uh, the earthquake there, we worked with the local telephone company to make sure there were food vouchers available with people so they could actually walk in and get food because they didn't have any money with them because of what happened. This is a significant opportunity to us. We're working with governments in, in, in Africa. We're, uh, launching a big a network in Latin America, but the goal to us is to use technology to get financial services down to the last mile. It's never been easier. Can I bring you in? Yeah. We as a company just recently uh, started our own internal uh, social network. Uh, primary two for, uh, purpose are twofold. Number one is improved communications, mm. and then number two is whenever we have a corporate wide uh, uh, you know, a uh, challenging issue, we just throw in and get people's idea, and mm. if uh, something comes up, we may or may not uh, pick them up. Uh, that's our primary purpose. Uh, on top of that, because of the nature of the business, 
medical representative is uh, uh, becoming uh, a lot tougher and tougher to see uh, physicians face to face uh, to so mitigate that the communication uh, uh, you know, shortage. Uh, we are using uh, uh, this kind of. Uh, so, so let me throw out some more difficult questions because you all neatly, I think, said that you think it's a great opportunity for all of your companies and you're all free and open and it's apart from Vikram, I think you said he's regulated so there are certain things. You're pretty happy to embrace and engage. Let me ask you some more difficult questions and invite you to step up. Who thinks that we should use the internet and companies in the internet space to force open freedoms in the emerging world? We've seen what happened in the Arab Spring. Should we be asking companies like Facebook and Google and Twitter not to give private information to governments, but instead to seek access in places where governments don't want it? I think uh, definitely yes. I think uh, uh, we need uh, social networks um, in, in uh, emerging markets, and especially in, in countries where, that still have authoritarian regimes and I think uh, uh, we saw what happened in, in the Arab Spring we, we've seen how uh, social media empowers the common citizen and allows them to connect and and to overcome uh, or, or go around uh, censorship you know official uh, uh, government censorship on, on media so I think uh, social media is a tremendously powerful tool to liberate populations around the world that are still living under uh, authoritarian regimes I think one of the interesting things we face now is that when we talk about the difference between a free and open internet and a more restrained internet, we naturally do think of countries like this in the Arab Spring. But I think increasingly we're seeing that question arise in places we don't normally think about it. So, you know, I get uncomfortable when I hear Western country leaders talk about civilizing the internet. We get uncomfortable when even democracies start making demands that there's content they want taken down. You know, we think about what just happened in the United States, which was a raging debate between intellectual property protection, which we all believe in, but things that would actually shut down access. So increasingly, it's not really just a question of the, the, the usual suspects who are non-democratic. Mm. It's actually the role that democratic governments are playing in how open the internet will be, how much free expression there will be, and how much regulation there will be that potentially, and even inadvertently, can stop that openness. So let me ask um, the other people on the panel this, because you're all, I think, in businesses where you have your own intellectual property developed in-house. And I think part of that piracy conversation that Wikipedia went dark over was a question about should intellectual property be shared without regard to the profit motive through the internet. And we've also got, let's not just focus on the United States, we have uh, Vivian Redding pushing through this data security legislation for Europe, which on the face of it appears very benign, but there are critics who say it's 10 years out of date and it misunderstands the rapidity of the transfer of data across electrons. So let me ask maybe some other people on the panel about this piracy question and whether we, we actually do need to limit some aspects of the internet and that there is a dark side to the internet. Well, there are, you've got to, uh, well, let me start by saying, by the way, the right to privacy is one of the most fundamental human rights. You can go back to the U.S. Constitution. You can go back to the Declaration of Independence in the U.S. and that's that. It's been a constant battle and that dialogue is not over. Yet, as a matter of fact, it's closer to the beginning than it is to the end. We need to have that dialogue. The dialogue on intellectual property, you know, if somebody came and stole that chair, <coughs> you'd have a different conversation. Is intellectual property different than physical property? Well, you can have a dialogue on that, but if it is, that's a very different world than the world that spurs innovation. There is a dialogue that needs to be had, a continual dialogue on that, and I suspect we're closer to the beginning rather than end when you'll get to respecting intellectual property. And then there is a third question, which you're asking, which is different, one of cybersecurity. Okay? If somebody breaks into your house, you know how to think about that. If somebody breaks into your network, how do you want to think about that? These are sort of very significant conceptual questions. I don't think they are hard, but I can tell you there are going to be different points of view on that, and that's the dialogue we need to have, and I believe we're at early stages of that, and we need to get a lot better at it. You wanted to come in? 
No, but here again, there's a dark side to anything you do. But, but again, yeah. you need to keep the debate right. The yeah. um, internet is a tool. It's a new technology that has come along and others will come along in the future. The issues that you raise, for example, on countries, is any country that doesn't respect its own people is bound to fail long term. The internet exposes it more. But the underlying issue is, is respect for your people. Any body that is um, not willing to respect intellectual property rights, I think, is setting itself up for failure in its underlying economy. The internet exposes it more. A respect for privacy is something that we all need to have. The internet exposes it more. So, yes, the internet galvanizes the debate, but the debate should be under the underlying values on how we want to run our society, which has increasingly become interdependent. Cheryl, can I ask you to respond to what you've heard here? It's just yeah. a tool. It's just another tool. Well, it's a tool, but it's an important tool. So sure. the right to privacy is hugely important and something we all need to respect and take very seriously. People must have the ability to own their own data, to delete their own data, and to share their own data when they want to. And we need to make sure that regulation allows for all of that. Same thing with security. I mean, if you look at law enforcement resources around the world, they're overwhelmingly put against, you know, in-person crime. You know, we actually feel like we could use more help on cybercrime. You know, if someone breaks into your house, people help on cybercrime. In many ways, industry leads mm. and the government follows and we need more help. I think the thing we have to understand with the relationship with governments and regulation is we need to make sure we're regulating the right goals and not the process because that's where it gets out of date. So for example, there are laws that have been passed where they specify that you must verify something by fax machine. Go find one in the United <laughs> States these days. But the law in the book says you must have a fax machine. Similarly, there are things being considered in different parts of the world which tell companies like mine, you must notify users. Notifying users is great. We're for that and we'll agree to that. The law should say, notify users the most effective way you can, because what they're talking about now is writing into the law, notify users by email. 11% of teenagers email every day. If you, leave, if you force us to notify by email, I promise it'll be slower than notifying by Facebook. And so we need to get to the right legislation, which gets to the goals, but understands that the methods of achieving those goals shift faster then the legislative or regulatory process can We're going to move on. Thank you very much indeed, our panel, for that. We're going to take a swift break. We'll be back in just a moment. We're talking about new models for 2012. So if we are so good at managing resources, why are a billion people still hungry? We'll see you in a moment. <laughs> good. So let's... Uh, sorry. It's coming up. 30? 20? Take less than that. Good. Everybody okay? We'll just move on. Good. Good. Yeah. We're back. Let's talk about living. Let's talk about the staples and the things that matter to the way we manage our lifestyles. Food, health, important things like that. Paul, I want to pick up with you. Um, are higher food prices here to stay? And why are they here to stay? given that surely we're sophisticated enough now to know how we match supply with demand. Yeah, no, we sure are. There are two things happening actually in the world right now that cause uh, the food prices to rise, but more importantly than the rise is actually the volatility that we see in food prices. And the statistics are very simple. We have 7 billion people, we're going to 9 billion people. That puts a, a pressure on the, on the demand for food. But more importantly, the, the, the people are changing habits. More and more people are entering the middle class, taking dairy products, taking meat, and that's an accelerator effect on the demand of food. <coughs> Some people have estimated, the FAO, that between now and the next 50 years, we need the same amount of food that we've consumed in the last 10,000 years, just to bring that home. 70% increase in the food capacity. That's why we spend so much time this week in the uh, World Economic Forum on bringing food security uh, on the top of the agenda of the upcoming G20 that Mexico will be hosting. It will be a big part of the discussions that we will have in Rio plus 20. We've launched here two years ago, which is gaining traction, the new vision for agriculture. And this demand that is there for food is, is manageable. I'm not a Malthusian disaster thing because that results in the growth of food 
that we can actually plan for and food prices will go up a little bit but not dramatically. What makes it more difficult is not the shifts that we see that I just described but the mm. shocks. The shocks that we see increasingly to climate change and, and other things that influence the volatility of the food prices. And that's why it's absolutely important that we work globally on the food security issue. Let's, let's just take this to everybody here. Yeah, yes, sir, Chica, I wanted to ask you, we were talking before we started the panel about this remarkable statistic. 40% of food is lost, wasted or spoiled in the supply chain. This is not shocks we're talking about. This is the way we manage our societies. Now, what's the problem here? Is it education, is it regulation, or is it bad business? And I think you told me that 40% figure is low in the <coughs> Japanese context. Yes. Uh, for example, Japanese are spoiled. Uh, even though Japanese are uh, uh, importing 5 trillion yen, which is uh, probably around uh, 20 billion, 25 billion or maybe 30 billion uh, US dollar equivalent per annum. So we are the uh, food importers. but. We are wasting more than the World Food Organization is uh, subsidizing to the developing countries, quantity-wise. That's a major waste. But that's because of the very, very uh, high demand from the uh, customer side. They just don't want to eat any uh, food on the convenience stores uh, where uh, in, on the shelf maybe more than six or say eight hours. That's why. Uh, you know, shopkeepers knowing they are still edible and no problem, but mm. just dump them. That kind of uh, business practice creates a big problem. And nobody, as far as uh, we can uh, uh, acquire the products, uh, food, and support uh, supply to the people, nobody wants to change that system. That is a problem, and I don't know. How can we change Japanese people's so, mentality? So is this an issue of the industrialized world and the emerging world? have very different needs when it comes to food security. Are we actually just recognizing that we have a conflict here? Actually, I would keep it at the global level because I think we have the conflict at the global level and we need to work together. Maybe 10 years ago, you wouldn't have seen Shell working with Unilever or Nestle or with Monsanto on the agriculture side. Um, and discussing how we can actually optimize, optimize the resources used in these various chains so because we are talking about food water energy and land usage and i think what we have learned also this week in davos is actually these things come together and we need to find new ways of actually working together and really helping um, to produce the right amount of food in the right way with the right process <coughs> using less water losing using less energy because otherwise we can actually not optimize that triangle anymore and I think we can only do this on a global basis because you will have countries with much more water whilst others have more or less no water and I think you cannot go regionally after these things you need to broaden this uh, yes just yes, talking talking about um, nutrition and uh, in, in uh, developing countries uh, I think uh, one thing that emerged from one of the sessions this week uh, at the World Economic Forum is that uh, there are very cost-effective effective interventions uh, that uh, will increase uh, nutritional levels in an important way in, in the poorest countries. There's 400 million children that have parasitic worms in the world today. And uh, those parasitic worms uh, not only reduce their, uh, the, the nutrition and, and health of the child, but also reduces school attendance and it costs only 50 cents uh, per child per year of a US dollar to uh, give him a deworming pill. So there are many things that have received relatively little attention than, uh, than other diseases like malaria, TB or, or HIV because usually you don't die from a worm but that really inhibits the, the development of children and that is extraordinarily cost effective. Paul. Yeah, no, very briefly if I can ask you. Very briefly, but the issue is bigger. There are a billion people going to bed hungry every day. They're sick. Uh, every six seconds a child dies of hunger. We need to attack that. 40% of the world population works in agriculture. 70% of these people are at the bottom of the pyramid. That's why we're looking at the food supply chain holistically, including waste. But as Peter says, it's only a small part of that. The new vision for agriculture, for the first time, looks at that holistically. It started mm. under the leadership of President Kikweke in Tanzania. Mm. It's about employment creation, especially smallhold farmers. It's about sustainable farming, and it's about yield increase. And I think we should uh, use the upcoming G20 
There are now 11 of these projects in the world to scale them up and to show the world that we can actually provide a different business model, which is what this great transformation we've been talking about here at the World Economic Forum is all about, to feed the world. At the same, at the same time, we have a billion people becoming obese and, uh, obese, and that's actually growing. That issue of health needs to be attacked at the same time. We've been talking about uh, models for 2012, really, and how we make the transformation going forward. I just want to change the tone slightly here and just lighten things as we come towards the close of our program. And I'd like to very quickly run along all of our panelists and just ask them for one personal ambition for 2012 that we might come back and talk about in 12 months' time. Peter. My personal ambition is really to move from debate to action to actually take the small projects we can do in order to actually improve on the many issues we have talked about. Obviously, we'll focus on energy, but I think there's a lot to be done, and I think we, we know what to do, and therefore move from debate to action. So Facebook's mission is to make the world more open and connected, and so my personal ambition, and hopefully the position, a personal ambition of everyone who is working with us, is to make the world more open and connected, give more people the power of voice, and the power to not just receive information, but reach out to others and form the kind of communities we're going to need to address the problems we've been talking about. My hope is that this year we recover momentum for the international trade agenda. I think uh, you know, trade talks have, have been uh, paralyzed for some years now, and I think we need to, to move on and, and to recognize that international trade is something positive for growth and for job creation. Move forward on the models we've developed for sustainable, equitable growth, use the opportunities of the G20 coming up and the Rio plus 20 to really lift the commitments we make. There are two moments in your life to plant a tree. One is 30 years ago and one is now. Let's plant it. Well, 2012 is a special year for city. It's our 200th anniversary. So we're going to commemorate that, rededicate ourselves to enabling progress, connecting the world and, uh, and igniting growth. World Economic Forum is a great place to learn what we need to do. I'm, I'm com coming from business world, so instead of putting blame on the, someone else, uh, we are just, just talking and not implementing. Why uh, do we need to do we take initiative and one step, just like described here, committed to improving the state of the world? That's our mission, and that's on our side. So I'm going to do something. We're just about to wrap up, but uh, Cheryl, I know we are in a froth of anticipation about what we might learn very shortly about your business. Um, I don't expect you to tell me very much about that. But what I will ask you is, um, we're very bad as human beings at thinking about dates and connecting them with meaningful moments. But we're very good at remembering events and connecting them with meaningful moments. When we get an announcement, hopefully soon, um, that. Facebook will be becoming a public company. <laughs> How do we connect that to a trend or a moment in history? Will it represent a coming of age for a whole new business model? I think the best thing it can represent is the kind of growth that creates jobs. So Facebook's a company that's barely seven years old and has created, you know, we have 3,000 employees around the world, not very much. But just the studies we've done in the last year say we've created more than 450,000 jobs just in Europe and the US, and obviously much more around the world. You know, the world is looking for economic growth, the kind of economic growth that feeds a billion people, that deworms millions of children who shouldn't have to live lives like that, and that employs people all around the world. And it has to be that new technologies, which sometimes take away jobs, must also grow jobs. And if this for the economy, can be seen as the job growth it is, and importantly for people, the opportunity to use their voice to change their world, we hope that's the part of, part of the movement we're part of. So pleased that you took the question. Thank you very much for answering. And thank you to all of our panel for what they've done for us in this program today. And a big thank you to our audience for being here and enjoying our event. Thank you for tuning into this program. We'll see you next time.